So good afternoon, everybody. I think we're, we're, we are live now. So it's part two of our Fallet's Gap, Fallet's Pocket Shows. And joining me very early in the morning in Canada is David O'Keefe as our historian. Hello, David. Hello. Good morning from Canada. And we've got Mag and Duncan out on the sites again. Now, a word of advice uh, for the viewers at the beginning of this, the re cell phone reception is just lousy down at... Um, uh, San Lambert. So at various points, we may lose both or one of the cameras. We've got Joe in reserve, who's another French guy down there. We'll see. We've got it at the moment and we will keep with the feed as long as we have. We've got images. I've got some film I took there a couple of weeks ago on our recce. So if we lose images, so be it. But we'll, we'll, we'll just take it and go from there. So here we are. So we are from beaming to you direct from San Lambert, Sardive, which is a little village in the middle of Normandy, lower Normandy, um, and uh, we've got two cameras out there now. So we're going to try and avoid doing too much of a background about how the Falaise Pocket was created, because that's not just what we, we're going to do on this show. We're going to talk about the action on the ground. But I will start with a little bit of map, and I'll bring uh, David in to talk about it. So here's a map showing um, the creation of the Pocket between August the 12th and the 17th. And our camera teams are in San Lambert, Sardive, which sits in the middle of the, the red arrow, which is the Germans trying to escape the, uh, the pocket. And the red shows the Germans and the green is the Allies pushing them in from the north. You got the Poles and the Brits and the Canadians coming from the north, more Brits coming in from the west, more Americans coming from the west and more Americans coming in from the south, all squeezing this um, pocket smaller and smaller. And this follows operations totalized and tractable the taking of Falaise, which we covered in our first show it follows the operation Lutich, which we covered in our mortan shows the failed attempt by the germans to take avranche and it's now the germans trying to get the hell out of dodge before their army collapses around them but we're going to be focusing in what happened in the little village of saint lambert sardive and the canadian the battle group that was there and then our second show in a couple of hours time we're going to have jenny grant on talking about the poles uh, at Montormel. So um, that's what we're talking about. And just to bring another image before I bring David in, this is a Google image I created a little while ago. Um, and it shows the various roads that converge um, on the village of San Lambert Sadi. I've numbered them one, two, three, four to five, although four, four branches into four sort of um, uh, cuts off those roads and you have the town of Tran or the village of Tran, Tournay sur Dive, Chambois and Borg Saint Leonard. Now the Americans of the 90th division, they're in Borg Saint Leonard by the beginning of August the 19th. Canadians have taken Tran on August the 18th. They've also taken Tournay sur Dive on the 19th. And in this forest, the forest that is, I'll show you on the live feed in a minute, the images Duncan is taking, are coming somewhere in the region of 120, 130,000 Germans, although some have already got out. And they're trying to get through a gap that is now reduced by the time of this, um, these events in Saint Lambert uh, to just 2.6 miles between Tournay, Sir Dive, and Chambois. But the bit we're talking about are between a bridge in Saint Lambert and the ford at Moissy, uh, which are the only crossing points of the Dive River, which runs still on this little dark, wiggly line there. And we'll talk and show about the river later on. So that's the, the routes the Germans are using, and they're all converging on this these crossing points. And it is a ridiculously small area for a very, very large force to be pushing into. So, and I'll let David talk. So, um, saint lambert sadiv it's a very, very important place in Canadian history. We're starting with the image of the French and Canadian flags there. Legendary action, legendary fo uh, photos. Um, as, a can as our Canadian... Why is San La why why did everything happen in San Lambert Sadiv? I know I've kind of said that, but what was happening on the morning of or the evening of we'll start with the 18th of August when a, a battle group arrived to where Duncan is now. So tell us the, the background of how how the Canadians ended up coming into this village. Well, from about the 16th onward, the Germans started to move through, and really it was between the 16th and the 19th where you start to get a main flood of German uh, soldiery that is now trying to squeeze through. So up above, um, at the higher levels, when you have Montgomery putting pressure on the Canadian Army under General Greer, and then, of course, he's sending it down to General Simmons at 2nd Canadian Corps, the idea was twofold for the 2nd Canadian Corps. One was to seal 
the pocket by pushing troops down through St. Lambert, through Moisey, and toward Chamois, where they expected to link up with either the Poles or the Americans. And at the same time, they were supposed to pursue those that had the German units that had already squeezed through. So it's a very difficult position for Simmons to be in at this point, where he literally has to fight two types of battle. One is going off and closing off the gap, and the other one is pursuing the fleeing Germans. So as this all trickles down, it's the South Alberta Regiment, supported by the uh, Argyle and Sutherland, uh, Sutherland Highlanders of Canada, who are basically taking point for 2nd Canadian Corps at this point, and they are part of the 4th Armored Division. They are the eyes, nose, and ears. They are the reconnaissance, at least the uh, South Alberta. And so as a result, they're working in, in what some people have termed a battle group, but in reality, it's it's a armored reconnaissance unit with a bit of extra support that are now heading down the road with orders to try to cut off the German retreat. Now, as you mentioned before, you've got about 120,000 Germans that are in the pocket stampeding through. Um, it's not necessarily clear, and I certainly don't think that anybody in the South Albertas understood what they were getting into at that particular point or what role they were about to play in history. And as you mentioned, this is incredibly important for Canadian history um, because not only the role that they play in helping the close the gap, but because the only Victoria Cross winner, and I, I hate using that term, those who earn the Victoria Cross, you know, recipient is the word I like. Yeah, recipient is the better word, of course, is uh, David Vivian Curry, who uh, earns it for his actions banding the South Albertas at this particular point uh, where we're looking at. Matter of fact, just down the road. And, and we'll be walking down there and we'll be talking about that famous photo later on in the show, folks. So uh, stay tuned. So um, and we'll we'll talk about where Mag is as well, because because Duncan is standing at the viewing platform that was set up by the Canadian Battle of Normandy Foundation about 20 odd years ago, which affords great views across the pocket. And there's been great informative maps there that explain who is coming in from where and what they're doing. But Mag is at a very important location as well, which Duncan, can you swing around and kind of show from where you are, where Mag is. And we can, I wanna get across that there's a bit of high ground just uh, to your left. So over there, see the copse of trees over there in the middle of Duncan's feed. Well, that's the middle of Hill 117 and Hill 117 becomes a critical part of this battle. And I urge people to go down to Normie to, to pay, take some time to head up to Hill 117. It's not signposted, you have to read a guidebook, but it's worth having a look at the views from there. And I'll put it onto Mag's feed now. So Mag is now on Hill 17. Now, where Mag is looking now, that dark wooded hill in the very rear of Mag's shot is Hill 262. That is a subject of the next show coming up in an hour and a half time with Jenny Grant. That's where the polls are. And we will try and do our best to refrain from mentioning the polls in this show because that's a separate story. They're not very far away. It's about, what, three miles, I suppose, of the crow flies? bit more possibly but that's a separate no. story now if you swing if you pan around mag i want to show you across to where the forest is where the germans are coming from um because right over there on the horizon is the the, the big forest you saw in my google image i showed a few minutes ago and that's where the germans have been assembling um to try and break out of this pocket and one of the myths we're going to try and bust in this show is is that the german army is in disarray because it at the lower level, perhaps if you're an individual German soldier in the, in the you don't know what's going on. But yeah. David, the German command, no, they know what they're doing quite quite clearly. They know what their plan is, don't they? So it, yeah, yeah, they certainly do. I mean, they're used to fighting these type of battles on the Eastern Front. Uh, in you know, getting encircled was not something that was considered to be absolutely horrific from the German perspective. They understood that that was part of the nature of mobile warfare, and that at times you are going to be surrounded and you're going to surround others. So they have perfect, oh well, perfected. They have certainly uh, striven to perfect the ways of breaking out of encirclement. And largely, that is simply with adept reconnaissance. So basically, finding the weakest point of your enemy's encirclement, and then having forces break into that point while you break out at the same time. But this requires forces on the exterior to be available. What's really fascinating about the uh, German performance, this part in Normandy, that they actually succeed earlier in breaking through with the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, only for the 2nd SS Panzer Corps to be stopped at Vumoutier, which is up the road, yeah. turned around, 
and sent back in to open the door and hold open the door. If, in fact, if Mag holds that shot there, over there where Mag is looking now is where these Germans are that David has just talked about. They are they're a bit beyond the where we can see, to be fair, but they are they're not they they are out and they're now trying to keep this pocket open. And I'll go back to Dave in a minute. But there's yeah. some high ground over there where the Canadians who have been looping around a resupport haven't quite got there yet. There is there is some space on the other side of the pocket, and that's where the second SS are sitting to try and keep this pocket open as long as they can. So um so I'll, I'll hand it back to David now and, and, and Mag, just as you're doing great, just kind of keep the camera moving like that. And the same, and I'll switch between Mag and Duncan's feeds for this part of the introduction. I think one of the things that a lot of people tend to forget um, is, you know, it's unlike when, you know, we fly into Paris and we drive two hours to get to Normandy or two hours to get back to Paris. It's not a steady drive. You're talking about military operations that work yeah. out. So as a result, the Germans now have moved into the forest and they're regrouping in the forest for the next bound. Some of them, without a doubt, have actually gone off on their own and moved through. But it is much more organized um, than we probably truly imagine. Um, the other thing, too, that you have to keep in mind, and we talked about this when we did our little pregame meeting yesterday, is that you're now talking about the most fluid action that has been seen on the Western Front since 1940, when the Germans break through. Yeah. And this is not something that the Western Allies are used to, um, particularly the British and the Canadians, who prefer more methodical set piece types of attacks. The Americans are a bit more adept at the kind of run and gun game. But for the British and the Canadians, it can unnerve them. And also, too, when you have you know the type of high command that they do, most of them are gunners by cultural upbringing, in other words, artillery officers. You generally do not advance as far or outside of your artillery umbrella. There becomes a, 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 you know, a, you're not in a comfort zone when you do that. So that's kind of the mentality that is shaping up on the British and the Canadian side. So these are things that you have to take into account when you're talking about the context and why the battle is fought the way it is from both sides. You have the Germans who are used to dancing to whatever tune is called and, and a lot of times calling their own tune. And of course, the Allies who are not interested in dancing to the tune that the German is called. No, they, they've got used to things going their way the last few weeks, haven't they? It's that we, we plan our operations and then we respond to how the Germans react to our operations. Now, for the, for the first time in weeks, we are now responding to the Germans. The Germans are falling back from Lutic. So we're now um, trying to pay catch up with what they're doing. But in order to, because Mag's not going to stay at Hill 117 for too long. So just talk about... Um, who arrives on Hill 117 on the August the 18th the evening and, and, and bring in Colonel Wotherspoon to the story. And I want sure. to get across as well, David, how from Hill 117, you cannot see into the village of San Lambert Sadiv itself. You can see to the poles, you can see to where yeah. the Germans are coming from, and you can see back towards Trun, where the Canadians are coming from, but you cannot see in the village. And that's the thing that I want to get across to people who, are coming to, who haven't been to Normandy, is these locations are really only a few hundred yards apart, but you cannot see any of them from the other ones. You're, you're, each one is yeah. separate. This is not Rourke's Drift, where they can send Lieutenant, Lieutenant Chard can say, right, where we need people on the south wall, let's send them over there. These are separate little battlefields with their own views that are that are that are close, but they're 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 visually not 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 within each other's yeah. sight. So there we are. No, you're, you're, there. you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, all, all of military operations are, are dictated by the terrain. And it's the same thing when it comes to the history of it. In other words, telling it, it's always great to walk the ground. But you get a better appreciation of how the story unfolds and exactly what you're saying. I mean, when the South Albertas and the Argyles arrive and they take Hill 117, Swati Witherspoon, who is, Witherspoon, who is the commander of the South Albertas, um, understands the tactical importance of this hill. It dominates, as you say, the axis of advance moving in and out of St. Lambert and in that area. But as you correctly say, there's a dead zone. Yeah, absolutely. That's where it dips down into the town itself. So when he sends David Curry and his company ahead, or his troops um, ahead, supported by the Argyles, they kind of disappear down into St. Lambert, and they only have two ways of communication. One would be radio relay or wireless relay, and then the other one would be runner if necessary. And but I think we'll have we'll have Duncan begin his walk down now because he's on foot. So Duncan, if you can start gradually kind of making your way down the hill so we can kind of recreate 
carries advance into into yeah. uh, the village. And then while we look, as long as we keep Duncan's feed going, of course, we'll see how what as David was saying, as Duncan pushes down, you're you're disappearing into a valley, and he's he loses the vision of the hill. Uh, the Wotherspoon on the hill now can't see what's going on, in Curry and, and Wotherspoon. Let's run through what forces Wotherspoon has on the hill. It's uh, anti-aircraft guns um, uh, and uh, M10s, a few shells. Has four, yeah, four Achilles, which are the M10, yeah. the 17-pounder version of the M10 tank destroyer that the Americans were using, which are extremely potent, without a doubt. Particularly when you're taking on tigers and panthers, and certainly, you know, Mark IVs would be easy pickings for them. Um, and they become key. Uh, without a doubt. Whereas um, the South Albertas usually have a mixture and a mixture between um, Sherman's and the odd Cromwell tank, from my understanding, and maybe a challenger yeah. as well. Um, so they have a mixed group that's going down. But again, they are not a main battle force. They are a reconnaissance force. Their idea is to get down, stir it up, find out what's going on, and if necessary, get the hell out. But those aren't the orders that are given to them. And I'm not sure if that necessarily suggests something about the state of the 4th Armored Division at that time. In other words, that they have been fighting now for about 10 straight days uh, and whether they're tired, etc. But they are now using their reconnaissance unit to go in and, in theory, close the gap. It is not something they're used to doing. You need infantry, a large infantry component to be able to plug holes. And in this case, they have about 10 tanks and roughly about 55 men from the Argyles who go with them. So you're not talking about an incredibly potent Canadian force, at least not in numbers, anyway. No, and um, and um, the difficulty is Wotherspoon, as we just said, to, to reaffirm it, um, with the with limited communications, he won't be able to, Wotherspoon won't be able to see what Curry is up to as he pushes down there. They lose sight of each other. So that's Duncan now moving down this and it's a very long, a gradual hill that runs down the village. And the village, village itself is in this dead zone, hence why we're going to have uh, mobile phone problems, I think, as, the, as they walk down there. Um, and in San Lambert Adiva is this vital bridge and this vital crossing point of the fall, which is actually a little bit outside of San Lambert and also Hamlet of Moissy. So um, let's recap. The Wotherspoon's force ar uh, arrives at Hill 117 the evening of the 18th of August, and there's an initial probe in the village that night, but they, they come under some friendly fire from some Spitfires, which causes some problems. They lose one tank knocked out by the Germans, so Wotherspoon decides to wait for dawn. Uh, so about six o'clock or five thirty, six a.m. in the morning of the 19th, and that's what Duncan is doing now. That we're recreating on August the 19th. Curry's battle group coming down. Yeah. What we say, battle group, is an armored. It's an armored reconnaissance patrol that has been perhaps relabeled an a battle group post event. Yeah. And at this point, David, they really don't know what's happening in there. They don't know that there are hundreds of German vehicles and thousands of German troops pushing this village. They are, they're thinking they're pushing straight through to Chambois to make a link up, aren't they? And exactly. Then, and so yeah. it's it's very much the lull before the storm as they push down here. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I mean, this truly is the fog of war because what's happening is the battle, the pace of the battle is moving so fast. And so even the adept allied intelligence, signals intelligence, et cetera, which is cutting edge, is still lagging behind. And so as a result, as Curry's moving down here, um, you know, he's probably under the impression that it's going to be a relatively smooth run against maybe a few rear guards here and there as they get to Chamois. Uh, that's not the case. As a matter of fact, the intelligence that's coming in is about 12 to maybe 36 hours behind. So in other words, that's something that you have to take into account that, you know, where they were or where they were heading is probably already where they are or even where they're past. The other thing, too, that you have to consider is very similar to what happened with the French in 1940, but not necessarily as acute, is the fact that the decision making cycle right now is moving faster than the Allies had encountered into this point. In other words, you have to observe what's going on, you have to react, you have to plan what you're planning to do and then putting it in, and you have to put it in action. And that's moving at a far faster pace than they've ever expected. So this is one of the things that I think Curry gets involved with. And, you know, in many cases, he's almost the accidental tourist here, you know, where he's coming into St. Lambert, not realizing that he's about to step into history. Absolutely. And we're coming up to the point where the, the, these very famous photos are taken and 
Uh, Maggie's in the village and her, her feed is already uh, losing her feed a bit, um, oh. which is understandable because of the connection. But we're going to bring, I'm going to bring up some of these famous photos. And the first one we're going to show are of the, of, of the advance, the tanks actually moving into San Lambert so deep. There's a couple of uh, famous photos. This is um, uh, two Sherman tanks of the South Albertas moving into San Lambert so deep. The one on the left, they say, has been knocked out. The one on the, uh, the right is passing it. That also gets hit. Uh, as we're going to talk about the action that happened very shortly afterwards, and and um, and it all kicks off essentially. And I move to the next photo. Oops, that's not the one I wanted. Hang on. Uh, I've got lots of photos to show today, and I may have to because I'm a problem of losing the images. So um, yeah, there we the go. Other one I'm going to get is this one here of a Sherman tank on fire as it pushes into San Lambert Sadiv, and it's just one of those simple French villages with. But basically, one road houses either side. That's that's all it is. There's nothing particularly, you know, complicated about it. It's not a crossroad particularly. Um, and I think we've lost both. We seem to have lost both feeds now. So oh. um, we'll we'll, um, we'll put I'll put you on screen for a bit, David, and we'll see yeah. what happens. But um, so what happened when they moved in? Well, I I, I gave away some of it there. They come under fire, don't they? They lose a Sherman, yeah. and and so it's explain a little bit about what was happening. Well, it's kind of sporadic. When they're going in there, there really is no organized resistance, per se, from the Germans in the no, town. Duncan again. Oh, there we go. So what you're seeing is different pockets um, of resistance that flare up from time to time. And you can imagine how confusing the situation would be. Um, so basically, where we are right now on the screen could have been pacified for five or ten minutes. But further on down the road, there'd be a very sharp firefight going on. And then next thing you know, there'd be a couple of German shells exploding in the area, maybe some of your own artillery coming down. Um, so in other words, it's sporadic. You're not really sure what is about to happen. It is not a controlled environment. And that's the thing. It's very much alive, very much in play when the South Albertans and Curry arrive. Absolutely. And, can... and, and this this is the view into the town. I, mean, we'll, I think if you can stop there while you've got your feet, we'll keep it on that image for a minute, Duncan, and, and perhaps just keep you with Lost Mag. And we'll talk about the famous photo. We've got to do it at some point. So let's talk yeah. about the famous photo. And and I'll just bring it up on screen now. So everybody watching this is going to be completely aware of this photo. And Duncan has just walked down he's actually gone past that building on the right with the uh the big chunk in the in the in the roof there um and he's about in line with the the buildings you can see in sort of the middle distance there yeah. so let's talk about that photo so david curry is is on the right there taking the surrender of a german uh, so on the left there talking on the to left a, yeah on the left and you've got the afpu army film and photographic unit uh yeah. filming it there and, it, and it's their jeep it's their afpu jeep so well, let's first let's talk about why the AFPU were there, David. We oh. talked about that in our recce last night. They they were you were thinking they were moving on to try and get the link up in Shomwar, is that right? Well, from what I can see from their accounts, that's exactly what they were trying to do. I mean, first of all, you're looking at probably the most famous photograph in Canadian military history, and yeah. probably one of the most famous ones of of the entire Normandy campaign. Um, you know, most people have labeled it as you know the closest thing you're ever going to see to somebody earning the Victoria Cross. Um, and certainly there's been a lot of um, uh, conjecture about why the Army Film and Photo Unit was there. But from the research I've done, it seems to be that they were in Trun earlier or late on the 18th. And they were getting reports overnight that the link up had actually occurred in Chamon, which was wrong. But, you know, these are the things that do happen. So they were quite eager to get down, as you can imagine, to film this historic moment. So as a natural course of their line of advance, they came or stumbled into the back of Curry's uh, unit as they were um, you know, just coming under fire in St. Lambert. So from what we can see, it was purely coincidental and arguably incredibly fortunate. So not only do we see this incredible photograph, but there's also film footage that was shot yeah. by the cameraman on the left, which you can see featured in a lot of the Canadian Army newsreels it's on um, YouTube, yeah. It, it gets heavily chopped about and edited with other things, some Argenton, yeah. and but it's yeah, you can get it, the image there, and it's extraordinary. They've got because you know I'm not interrupting you, Dave, but I'm interrupting you. But in the mid, it, behind the German's head there, I think that's kind of smoke and dust from an engagement actually taking place further down the road. While yeah. this surrender's going on here, there's actually um, 
German armor pushing from right to left and German troops pushing from right to left. And we'll show um, further down the street with some Im images later on. So, yeah, I mean, it's you've got a surrender taking place in the middle of a battle. Um, so it's well, this is this is just the nature of what we would see at this particular point, um, you know, where, you know, 100 yards down the road, you've got a fierce battle going on. And then meanwhile, You've got the lead elements of a reconnaissance, German reconnaissance, or, you know, a Panzer battalion that end up making the wrong turn, um, you know, not realizing that the Canadians are 100 yards, you know, to the left up the road, and they just stumble into them. And part of the evidence for that uh, is actually from that film where you can, you can see the Bren gunner um, alerted and alarmed that the Germans are streaming right at them. And of course, it's being led by a motorcycle and sidecar. And there's a couple of soft top vehicles that are coming along after it. And so he's, you know, he's lining up, uh, you know, to take a shot at them um, on the back of, um, I don't know if it's a Jeep or an armored car, but it's something with a windscreen. And he's actually about to fire through the windscreen. And you can see the startled images on all their faces when, you know, the Germans just arrived. But that really encapsulates the nature of what is happening at this moment. Yeah. Well, well, we'll keep Duncan going. I think we might. I mean, Mag, we've lost Mag. Mag's down near the town hall. She's further down the street somewhere. Um, so, yeah, this action kicks off. There's there's surrenders. I mean, let's let's we, we said on I said on Twitter, we would address who the, the German officer may or may not be. Yeah. And people on Twitter got talking about it. But the the interesting thing is, is that, that we're not 100 percent. So no one's going to be 100 no. percent certain. But tell me what you you understand about this German officer. Okay. And we'll do that quite quickly. Okay, there's, yeah, there's a couple of stories. First of all, there's one of the problems with famous photographs is that everybody has an opinion about it. Um, and for the longest time, um, nobody was really sure on the identity of a couple of people. One of them is the gentleman actually to the left. You, you've blown it up a little too much. Yeah, but yeah. On the left, there's a gentleman yeah, talking yeah. to the And a lot of people thought he was with the French resistance, et cetera. He was misidentified as a gentleman by the name of Wolf, when in reality, his name was Lowe. And that has been uh, confirmed through some of the best forensic work that you can do with photographs, et cetera. So that was one of the first misidentifications, if you will, in this photo. The other one is the German soldier, the German officer. And what's fascinating about this, and again, I will caution that this is a story that still needs much more research. So if there's somebody out there who wants to take up the torch and go after this, by all means, please do, because it's a fascinating uh, story is uh, in 1960, uh, McLean's Magazine, which is the big national magazine in Canada, used that photo on their cover. Um, I'm not sure whether it was to commemorate the battle, etc. I'm not exactly sure what the context was, but it was on the cover. And at that particular point, Colonel C.P. Stacey, the Canadian military historian, received a letter from a German woman who lived in Canada, who had come over after the war, and had asked about the photo because in the photo she identified the officer as her son and apparently that's a Hauptmann Rauch. Now I don't think any of this has ever been confirmed so that would be step one to try to confirm that identity but her question was very poignant and very salient and um, uh, quite important because she said I need you to explain the circumstances because that's a picture of my son, and there's film footage to go with it, falling into Canadian hands as a prisoner. Yet somehow he died within a couple of hours of this. Can you explain why? Yeah. Well, as far as I know, there was no answer ever given. But there are plenty of rumors, kind of like, you know, we were talking about Band of Brothers, kind of the stories around Spears that kind of get bigger. Well, the story is, and if we go back to the picture, there is a company sergeant major with the Argyles. His name is Mitchell, and he's the really tall guy. Now, David Curry, um, uh, the man on the left, low, is supposed to be about 5'11", which makes David Curry probably about 6'2", yep, 6'3". Yep. And if you go across to the gentleman talking to the officer, he must be a good 6'4", Four, yeah. six foot five. He must be one imposing figure. And his name was, well, his, he was a company sergeant major by the name of Mitchell from the Argyle. And the scuttlebutt, and that's probably the best way of putting it, going around the mess, is that Mitchell was not too thrilled with his arrogance, the German officer's arrogance. And then sometime after the photo was taken, he took him around back and he shot him. 
And of course, at first, everybody would assume that this is nothing more than a little bit of, you know, urban legend. But it is something that the Argyles apparently in their mess um, are openly discuss. And allegedly, Mitchell did as well. Um, I don't know how much truth there is to all that. But it's certainly, you know, we can't come out and say either way that it happened or it didn't happen. Well, I mean, we could probably say it didn't happen until we see the evidence. But the point is, it requires further investigation. It's an Absolutely. interesting, you know, and that's the thing. So we, we you know, we have to reserve uh, final judgment. But it would be fascinating to see if anybody can pull up a little bit more on it. I tend to believe right now it's kind of in the realm of the Spears story. In other yeah, words, I mean, I mean someone, know, someone posted an identity on, I'm just trying to check on my phone. Someone posted, another, I think it was another name as who it was. And oh. um, Klaus Samos, Samalowski was what, who David Ellum said he was. And he posted, posted a portrait of this guy. And Very I have to say his jawline does look, look a little bit like the guy in the photo. So I don't know. That's two positive possibilities of who it could be. So anyway, yeah. we could spend the day talking about this. So let's... I um, mean, yeah, and there's a lot of controversy over photographs anyway when it comes to identifying people. We're, I mean, we're halfway yeah, through the show roughly now. So yeah. they're both both cameras, well, all three cameras are now in the center part of the town near the mairie, near the town hall. Yeah. So I'm going to show up a couple of photos of the action around there. And then we can talk about that. Then we're going to move to the all-important bridge so this is a photo of the crossroads and now that is looking down on towards Chambois and Mag I don't know which one of you is there but whether you could show that gap in the wall where the Sherman the gap with the fence where the Sherman came out and coming out on the right that photo is a Panzer IV coming out there's a barrel there and there's the hull of a Panzer IV and these are our guys pushing through towards Chambois and I'll try and get that exact look for you now no John Joe's feed is coming in so uh Sure. Let me, um, no, hang on, I can't get Joe's. Yep, that's Joe's. So there's that, if Joe holds that image now, that building there in the, in the in the right is the building in that shot. And then behind Joe is where the Sherman came out of. And the, and the, the German vehicles are coming in that road from the right then. I'll try yeah. and put Duncan's feed on again now. Um, are you, the, where are you, Duncan? Uh, yep, you, you, I can't see where you are, Duncan. Uh, where's Mag? Anyway, I'm really is... at where the photo is. Um, okay. Give me 30 meters and I'm there. Okay, we'll keep it on you for a second then, and then we'll, we'll move over to the bridge and do, do some stuff there. So, you know, this, the, we've got this great photographic record of, of the battle here. Unfortunately, we haven't got a very good cell phone signal uh, down there. So, unfortunately, mm. that's the, well, the limits we have. And we knew it was going to be a problem. The third show will be fine again. It's just this second show was a, um, for whatever reason, it's a really, really bad signal down there. Yeah. Um, so I'll put it back on Joe's camera again. I think it's going to come in in a second. Well, it's interesting that we're having the kind of there problems we we're having because those were similar to what Curry was experiencing. Well, you know, indeed, and the Germans were having communications issues as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he had to send out. Uh, he had to send out one of his uh, one of his half tracks um, to act as a wireless relay because communications were so bad <laughs> on that day. So, you know, the audience is getting a taste of what it was like to be Curry at that morning. Yeah. So, um, well, I'll bring up another image again now. So there's another image of the, of the town. I've got, just bear with me. Uh, yeah. so, well, I guess uh, one of the things that, you know, we, we probably should talk about is why we're here. In other words, why do yeah, we get yeah. to this particular point? And it really, it comes down to the Germans. Um, the Germans are looking for any escape route out. And of course, they have an idea of which way to go. They had three possibilities. They had a bridge up a trunk. They had the bridge at St. Lambert in the middle, and then they had a bridge at Chambois. And of course, Trun had fallen to the Canadians. The Germans suspected that Chambois had fallen. It hadn't, but at this point, they didn't realize the escape route could have been open there. Uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. So, Maggie, I've yeah. met, right, Duncan is now at that fence there in the, between the wall is where the Sherman tank is sticking its nose out. I'll bring the photo up again. Mm. So, yeah, we're, we're losing all the camera feed. So, I'll bring the photo up again. But that uh that photo that gateway there where the sherman tank is is where duncan yeah. is right now yeah. and you've got these actually there's two little roads coming in from the right there's the first track just beyond the lamppost and then beyond the, the tank hull is a second road coming out just in front of the house and i'll go back to whose feed i've got now I'll go back to duncan's feed um yeah, there are those two. If you can swing around right a bit, Duncan, and get that little track, there should be a track just behind to the right behind that white car. Is there? 
the track that goes off to come towards the church. There we are. That's that says one road there, and the there we are, there we are, folks. We're in the exact location where these where these photos are taken. I've, I've, the bandwidth is really low, so I don't know how good the quality image is coming through. But mm -hmm. okay, we're doing our best. So, um, uh, Duncan, when you make your way to Mag, I think you should all push on towards the bridge now, and we'll carry on telling the story from there and hope we get a connection near the bridge. Um, good. So. Um, well, we've had some images in the middle of the town, so that's good. So we're on, onwards and upwards, where we're progressing. Um, and at this point, David, uh, Curry doesn't really know. He's not really aware of the bridge. He is, or he's certainly not aware of the significance of the bridge no. yet, is he? And then he no, also not at all. I mean, what, down what towards you... the bridge and realized, my God, that's where all these Germans are coming from. Well, that was the thing. You know, uh, it, it, there were three bridges, as I mentioned. One at Trun was in Canadian hands. The one in Chambois, although still up for grabs, the Germans didn't realize that. So all roads led to St. Lambert, the only bridge in the entire area, other than the small little Moisey Ford, which you, you could get uh, tanks across or certain. Um, the only bridge left standing where you could move tanks and heavy equipment was in St. Lambert. So the Germans basically realized that, you know, the entire operation was going to succeed or fail based on grabbing that bridge in uh, St. Lambert and then using it for all it was worth to squeeze as many men and material or men and machines out as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So I think they're on their way to the bridge now. So, um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to I'm gonna put up an aerial, I've got an aerial photo of the bridge. Uh, just post-war, I've just got a, I've got a lot of images to play with today, folks. So bear in mind while I bring it up. So this is this is actually there's I say a bridge, and David said there is that a second little bridge that was actually there in the war. So there's the image on the screen now. The main river yeah. bridge, and the div is about 10 foot wide, is in the, the, the center right of the photo. Then just down below it was a small, it wasn't suitable for tanks or armored vehicles. It was a little crossing point, I guess, the farmer used to take his little, you know, horses across the field there. Some infantry, of course, could have used it, but we don't count it as a usable bridge for armor because it wasn't a usable oh. bridge for armor. And when the, the camera teams get to place, what uh, Mag is going to be near the church over to the left of the photo and, and Duncan's going to be near the bridge, at least we hope. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens when they get there. But, um, so uh, as David, as, as Curry finds out the importance of the bridge, he then has to start redeploying his armored, his force. And that's where things get difficult for him because he hasn't exactly got a very large force to go around. He's got Wotherspoon back on Hill 117. He's got to think about holding the main road. He's got to think about covering, most importantly, the road behind him because if he wants more fuel for his Sherman tanks and more ammunition, he's got to keep the road to Tron open. And there's Germans trying to get out from behind him as well. And he's now got to look after his bridge. And eventually he's got to try and think about getting a patrol to the uh, to the Ford. So, you know, yeah. he's fighting numerous fires at the same time. And so incredible. And you wonder why he earned the VC. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, he's being handed uh, an operation that should have been handed essentially to the king. And, you know, he's, he's now a weakened um, uh, battle group, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, he has maybe about 50 men, 50 infantry. He's short. As a matter of fact, what he's doing is he's stripping the 50 cals off of his tank destroyers and his tanks, and he's putting them down on the ground, um, trying to substitute lack of or, or firepower for lack of manpower. He is yeah. trying to close whatever gap as you know he can, and you can imagine what it's like. I mean, he's a very small island in a fast-moving stream, and the Germans are just flooding around. They're flooding through. They're flooding around, and he's doing the best he can. There's no doubt about it. He's inflicting severe casualties. You know, three three hundred to five hundred men killed, uh, Germans killed, and about another two thousand taken prisoner. I mean, that, that's remarkable. That's, you know, essentially unheard of until the last days of the war. And, of course, you know, that's what they're thinking. Once the Germans start to collapse, they start fleeing. They're looking back to 1918, post-August 8th, and they're thinking that this is another 100 days, that the Germans are about to, you know, throw in the towel. All the indications are there. They tried to kill Hitler a couple of weeks ago. The German army is, you know, in full retreat on the Eastern Front. It's collapsing in Normandy. How the hell can they survive, you know, another, you know, 100 days? They're going to, you know, they're going to throw in the towel at least by September, if not October. So there's that spirit in the air. But for Curry, he's almost fighting three separate battles, as we discussed last night. And he's kind of, he, he's penny pocketed his men out. He has some back in the northern part of the town, some, you know, some that are down in the south around the bridge. And the idea now would be to consolidate. 
But if he can consolidate his men, or if he has to, then he's going to leave other gaps open if he doesn't have reinforcement. And the 9th Brigade of the 3rd Division was supposed to arrive and do that job, but they have yet to show up uh, for whatever reason. So yeah. he's out there alone. And again, like we've said a couple of times, his unit is not your traditional unit that you would be used in this kind of fighting. They're armor reconnaissance. They're about mobility. They're about getting in and getting out quickly. They're not about holding ground. And now that's exactly what he has to do. And it proves to be an incredibly deadly and difficult uh, mission for them to uh, for them to carry out. So I've just shared an image of the bridge that I took to speak Recky for this. And I want to particularly get across the, as Sheldrake 6 is watching on YouTube, that it's not the, the width of the river, it's the steepness of the banks that yeah. makes the issue. Infantry can almost, you know, take a running leap and you're across it, or just, you know, it's two yeah. inches deep, the water, but the banks are six foot, maybe eight foot in places. So that's where if you can try and get your vehicles out and, and not just your tanks, but your armored cars and your soft skins and your Kubel wagons and your staff cars and your horse-drawn wagons, you need the bridges. Um, and that's the little bridge there that, that, that is this vital crossing point. Whenever you go there, folks, you'll have no idea when you're standing there. It doesn't seem to make sense that somewhere so tiny mm. can have been so important. Here's another photo yeah. that I took a couple of weeks ago, anticipating these, these connection problems. Yeah. That's showing the road back into the village. So Duncan and the camera teams are just driven towards where the camera is and the bridge is behind where I was taking that photo. That's the old church of Saint Lambert, Sir Dave. And this is where David Curry has to deploy his, uh, or some of his force, and there'll be Sherman tanks facing towards the camera around the church, beyond the church, trying to yeah. defend this bridge. And it, you know, it, it gets frantic because German infantry can get around him and across. And so yeah. he's, you know, he's surrounded. And Hill 117 that we talked about earlier, they had these massive problems of infantry, uh, German infantry from the second SS who've got out trying to force yeah. their way back in to keep the, uh, the, 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 the gap open. So, but all of these forces are surrounded on all sides by lots of enemies. Some who are out, some are trying to get out. And it's, it's just, you know, a very nightmare yeah. situation. So I think the, the only... I think the only redeeming factor are, you know, for the for the Curry and his men at this point is that the Germans are not necessarily uh, committed to going after them. They're committed to getting past and getting out. And I think if it was another way, if, you know, if this happened to be the Schwerpunkt, as they call it, of the concentric attack coming in, um, we know, might not be talking about Curry as surviving this battle, let alone his men. Um, yeah. You know, they, in some ways they did get off lucky. Uh, in the sense that the Germans were just trying to get the hell out of Dodge, as you said earlier. And we got a question about what air support they, uh, Curry has. And at this point, not a lot, really, is it because of communications and friendly fire possibilities? Well, that was one thing that I looked into last night. And of course, you know, Mike Bechtold, uh, you know, once again, comes to our rescue when it comes to air power. And same thing with Alex Black. Um, the idea was that, yes, there was air power, but unfortunately, it was, it was coordinated from division level upwards. And most of it was not kind of like what the Americans are doing by inserting, you know, uh, pilots in the front lines and, and uh, to work as forward air controllers and then vectoring in a, you know, a, a standing air cover above. Most of what we see is armed reconnaissance that are kind of roving around. So it, it was by chance that a you know, the aircraft would be vectored in on this particular area or would be roaming by. So it wasn't like Curry had a forward air controller with him, be, you know, able to harness a cab rank above him and bring them in. So in this particular case, it's, you know, one of the lessons learned, I suppose, for fighting operations like this, particularly when you're under men and you were trying to, you know, substitute firepower for manpower, is make sure, you know, you've got those angels on your shoulder, yeah. instead, like I said. Well, we've, we've obviously got a Duncan's camera feed, albeit a little bit um, poor connection, but at least we've got images of the river there. And while Duncan is showing that view, which is he's now facing into where the Germans are coming from, there's a couple of uh, photos taken of, of German vehicles in that area there that show you just how, how desperate things were. And I'll bring those photos up because they are, they are incredible um, uh, detailed about exactly what's going on with the German. The one I'm going for is this one here. And there's a house in the background of that photo there uh, that maybe Duncan can get in his shot in a minute. And this is the bank of the D. This is just 
Oh, right. about 25 meters from the bridge. The bridge is to the left, that photo. And there's a staff car and there's an artillery piece. And there's a truck there. There's a dead horse. There's yeah. another gun or armored vehicle there. And this is what happens is this beginning of this German organized columns, the more they are restricted to smaller and smaller routes, the more their problems are mounting because they're yeah. streaming some of seven and eight columns of vehicles that are in, a, in a breast for roads that are, that are one vehicle width. And you can see some of the desperation that, that starts getting in from the German side for the men on the ground. And that's an amazing image that, and I'll go, and there's Duncan showing us how steep the, uh, the river banks are there. So, um, the 20th of August, let me, cause we, we, we must push on with the show. The 20th of August was the real maelstrom for curry, wasn't it? That's when yeah. the Germans make this concerted effort to get their last remaining troops and vehicles out the pocket. And basically everything hits him that morning. There'd been rain and drizzle the night before, and things have been relatively quiet the night before it, 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 for the, yeah, and then compared to what was had been happening before. And then it all just kicks off in the morning of the 20th, doesn't it? And you know, Panthers yeah. and Tigers and Panzer Fours and armored cars coming everywhere. So run through us a little bit about what's happening that day for us, David. Well, it's what we alluded to before. The Germans um, are not just simply stampeding. Some of them are, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there's a massive humanity, kind of like a tidal wave coming towards Curry and the Canadians. But at the same time, the second SS Panzer Division, our Panzer Corps, which has extricated itself and it finds itself around Bumuche, is now turning around and coming back. So basically, the Germans, um, not because they've necessarily, you know, um, uh, ap uh, you know, appreciated that this would be where it was going to happen, but because of their adept reconnaissance and sort of the fingertip feel that they exercise in battles like this. They realize that the soft part of the of the Allied line in this area is right around Saint Lam, uh, right around Saint Lambert. Yeah. So not only do you have the massive humanity, which you know numbers somewhere around the remnants of five Panzer divisions, about another five infantry divisions, and a parachute you know division, um, which is reduced to about two thousand men. Uh, the Germans now are looking to push in from the opposite way. So Curry literally is surrounded and is about to be hit on both sides, uh, which is something he has no clue is about to uh, unfold. And it starts in the night. It starts in the night with the uh, parachute, the falchum yeah, yeah. Uh, that now start infiltrating around the position. And again, luckily for Curry, they're not trying to take him out per se. They're trying to get out and they're trying to link up with the elements of the second SS Panzer Corps, which are now coming to meet them. That is their primary goal. But behind them is this, you know, mass of German soldiery that are trying to squeeze into this bottleneck that is St. Lambert. And, you know, I just love that photo that you just showed because it really gives you an idea of what happens when they kind of stumble, the Germans as they're trying to get out, are all congregating towards this bridge. And there's no way that you can get, because of the, you know, the Deve River, which essentially is an anti-tank ditch, there is no way that you can get your vehicles to cross. You have to queue up, line up for that bridge. So and everything is just unfolding around Curry at this time. Couple and he, he'd, been, he'd been in kind of control for some of it. Through the 19th, you know, he's able to um, rotate his Sherman tanks back and yeah. forth up to Hill 117, refuel them, rearm them. Yeah. Um, uh, then some reinforcements. B Company, the Argyles arrive down and they push on towards Mussy Fall but get beaten back. Yeah. So he's kind of in control. And then on the morning of the 20th, as I kind of confirm, it, it all just starts getting overwhelming. Um, it does. And, and, but luckily, in, in the kind of the cavalry arriving in the nick of time, help arrives in the shape of 17 pounders um, from an anti tank unit of the Canadian Royal Artillery. Yeah. And they go into crash action around the church. Mag's feed was there a second ago. It seems to have gone again now. Let me check. We've lost Duncan. Um, Mag, I think, is there. Um, and these 17 pounders go into crash action around the church, and there are targets. I mean, they they, they, yeah. they don't even need their sights anyway, because there's tanks. No, no, they're fighting, they're firing over open away. sights. Yeah, they're firing so, over open sights. I mean, it's you know, it's a shooting gallery. So this photo I'm showing now is taken exactly where Mag and Duncan are staying. That building in the background there with the white arch doorway, if we can, I'll show a, a modern photo, and there's a Panther and another German tank in 
on their side in the runoff from the Dive there. That's just between the bridge and the village near the church. And these would have been knocked out either by the 17 pounders or they've been knocked out by the artillery coming in um, from, from uh, the yeah. artillery control from forward observers on Hill 117 or from the Sherman tanks of Lidge. And it's incredible photos. I'll try and get the next one if I can. That's interesting you're talking about the back. artillery. There. There's another tank. There's a half yeah. track. There's all, and all this is piled up right in this beautiful, picturesque little village of Lower Normandy. Yeah. Well, there's one thing about the artillery. I know the Curry at one particular point during the battle um, expected that it would be the typical 25 pounder support he'd be getting from his field regiment. And he, you know, he was quite thrilled about that because it would be effective against German infantry and soft skin vehicles. But relatively speaking, uh, unless they got a direct hit in the turret, his tanks would be fine. Well, he wasn't too thrilled when it was 5.5 mediums that arrived. Yeah, because yeah. now it was a question of taking out anything and everything. And when he complained to Witherspoon about this, Witherspoon just basically said, and this is the nature of warfare, he said, well, they're killing more Germans than they are of you. Don't worry. And, and there's so that, that view. Was... I just showed that view there. The mod. This is one of the photos I took two weeks ago. There's that white dot. And that's only the director of the Montour Mel Memorial I'll be filming from later. But Jenny lives in that house there. And those two vehicles were on their sides in that runoff just where the wow, fencing is there. And I'm glad I had these images ready in case we lost it. We seem to have got Duncan's feed back in again now. So while we've got it, I'll use it. Um, I say that. Oh, there it's coming in. I think it's coming in. Um, yeah, it's coming. So, yeah. so things were getting very desperate and very fraught around there. And to me, it has to be said, they do end up kind of losing the bridge, not because no. of any other reason. They're just running out of tanks, running out of people. And there's an overwhelming number of forces coming towards yeah. them. And, and, and overwhelmed. correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Curry actually requests permission from Wotherspoon to pull out at one point, and Wotherspoon says, no, sorry, mate, you've got to stay. Um, by then, they realize how critical this point is. Yeah, it depends on the accounts you read. I mean, some of the accounts suggest that they did pull back to a certain degree. Some have even suggested that Curry pulled back to the northern part of the town. Um, what is clear, though, is, I mean, they put up one hell of a fight. But as you mentioned, they're completely overwhelmed. There's only so much you can do. But what it also does, and this is interesting, is it doesn't necessarily give the Germans a complete clear route because the Germans now start moving further down the road towards Moisy. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, because they now think, well, okay, the Allies have made it to this particular point and our crossing is going to be snuffed out at any moment. Let's just keep moving. And again, you know, you mentioned it before, you know, um, you know talking about St. Lambert. Just think about the thousands of places, probably tens of thousands of places in Europe, in World War II, in North Africa, in Japan, or, or in uh, Asia, that never expected to host war, ever. There was nothing strategic in the town until the circumstances made it important. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when I, when I lecture about World War I, I talk about it, it had no strategic value until it became strategic. Well, it's the same thing with St. Lambert. The tiny little sleepy little town on the Deep River was, you know, essentially expecting to have a morning like any other. And it didn't. Absolutely. And, you know, we're, we're, we're powering through the hour we've got. So they're heading off our last stop of Moissy Four, where, again, the, the, uh, the connection may be iffy. I'm showing a couple of photos that show the area backing up to San Lambert, Sir Deve, to Moissy Ford, where you can see... Uh, the German vehicles have been turning in circles trying to find ways out at various points. And there's columns of vehicles all stacked up. It's hard to be certain exactly where these photos are. They're all taken in this area near San Lambert, Sir Dave. And you can get a sense from these aerial photos of the desperation. It, it needs to be mentioned, of course, that the German transport is a lot of it's horse drawn. So they've got yeah. you know, animals involved with the convoys as well, which makes. A, a emotional drama as well you know driverless horses and riderless horses and things that the, the desperation starts setting in after a while yeah um so they're heading off towards the fort now i mean we always talk about you know the, the panzer divisions because of course they're the you know the main fighting units and they're the sexy ones but you know you have to realize the vast majority of the german army even in 1944 is still horse drawn and, you know, I don't think you've got a better visual example of that than some of the photos that we're seeing out of the gap or, you know, what they would eventually call the shambles. Um, the whole killing zone that becomes yeah. the Falaise Gap in this area. 
So they're, they're driving off now towards Massey 4, which is where we'll bring this show to an end. And um, I'm, I'm, yeah, the feeds have been okay. We've lost it a tap of time. We've had some images coming through. And this is the back road that takes you to Massey 4. And again, I want to get across the idea that when you're reading one of the books, you know, the big the Mark Zelke books or the the, the distance between San Lambert and Massey Ford on the maps seems really very close. When you actually drive it, you realize you go over these sort of undulating fields and things. There is no line of sight between the Ford and the bridge whatsoever. And it is really a separate battlefield. And um, the Ford itself, which is a remarkable place, and we'll see if, 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 we, if we can't get live images in there. I took a bit of film there uh, two weeks, which I'll play. In fact, I'll play it now. I'll play... Yeah. Um, uh, a bit of footage I took. This is the German route down to the Ford. So let me bear with me. And this is a bit jerky. I just took it on my camera, my camera phone last week. So this is um, this is the, the route down to Moissy Ford. I didn't have my phone on a stabilizer. I took this because I realized that the, sig the mobile phone uh, signal was going to be so bad down there. And this lane you read accounts about how seven and eight German vehicles abreast have been pushing for this single lane. And I always make the point, I'll let David talk in a minute, that the German army have kind of triumphantly arrived in Normandy four years earlier with their entire army groups and taken over all these towns. And it now gets to the point by August 20th, 21st, 1944, the remains of army group B are slipping across almost individually across a little picturesque ford in the middle of lower yeah. normandy it is a, uh, a a crazy way to to leave to leave the region and that was a short clip i put in there um so um well they're, they're pushing their way down the ford now i'll show another couple of photos of the ford as it looks now in case you don't get any images this is um uh a photo of the ford it's got a little bridge across it now um, for yeah. pedestrians and wagons and horses can still go through it. And every August, there's a group of German reenactors take their Kubel wagons and cross across it, which is kind of nice to see. And uh, but that's the Ford as it was or is today. And um, there's the Ford as it was sometime taken at the end of the battle with just I'm going to use the word shitloads of German vehicles and guns all stacked yeah. up in that field, all approaching this little crossing point there. Um, so what was the situation at the Ford, Dave? We've seemed to have lost uh, both cameras. What, you know, because no one was there. The Americans hadn't got there. Oh. The Ninth Division hadn't managed to get there. The Poles haven't got there. The Canadians do try and get there, but they get beaten back by MG42 fire. So that ended up pretty much staying in German hands, didn't it? Although, as I said, yeah. it's, a, it's not a, the best crossing point. It's a Ford. And, um, yeah, it's not. I mean, you do have problems with some of your heavier equipment going through there. But I mean, one of the things is, and this is fascinating, because as much of it as the end of one chapter of this story, it actually is opening up the next chapter, which you guys are dealing with in your next episode, which is the Battle of Mormel, or Battle of the Mace, as it was called. And part of it is because the Polish Armored Division, which are now fighting a little bit north of this area, are given the task of taking both Hill 262 North and 262 South. They fail to grab 262 South for a number of reasons, which I'm sure you'll get into in the next uh, next show. Yeah. But what that does is that suddenly gives the Germans, the Germans realize this, that 262 South is open. So it now suddenly magnetizes them all right, to that particular area. So now they're pushing through Moise to be able to get towards 262 South because they see that now as the only escape room. And it's kind of like you and I were talking about yesterday. In other words, it's kind of like a, a wave of water coming out of a wall of sand that eventually the water is going to find the weak point in the sand and will naturally go to wherever the first part of that wall crumbles. Yeah. And so that's basically what we're seeing right now. We're seeing the the allied wall. I mean, you know, they claim that they've cut the gap, but in reality, it's, you know, not even a band-aid on a gushing wound. It's something even less. Um, it's one thing to physically show up, you know, tag the guy at the other end and say, wow, we've, you know, we've done this. It's another thing to actually put or hermetically seal it by putting a guard across. And the allies can't do this. Uh, at this particular point, or at least the Canadians, they're running out of steam. Uh, now are that picking up steam because they can see daylight, if you will. And that's basically what we're getting at Moisey, that they're able to hold Moisey open. But once they get across, 
then they get into a whole new world because now they're moving through small tracks. They're moving through tiny little valleys. Sometimes they have to go up over hills, which are anywhere between 500 to 1,000 feet in, in height. Um, and it's a very isolated kind of battlefield. Um, it's kind of like, you know, Greek city-states developed in the ancient world because they never went over the mountains. They were isolated by their terrain. It's kind of the same way here, where you get a series of isolated little battles being fought, yeah. with the exception of the mace, which, of well, course, as the Germans push up, that becomes the big battle at this point. Well, I think the point I want to make is the Germans have been trying to get to these crossing points some of them for for two weeks almost um and certainly it's been a, it's been a, you know days without sleep there we haven't talked much about not so much in the, this area here but on their way to uh san lambert as they're coming the other side of the forest they're being you know the cab ranks of typhoons and mustangs and spitfires so they've not had any sleep they're not you know they're, they're, they're they've been struggling but you must imagine if you were a german soldier if you were part of the first ss or the whatever and you got across that ford at Moissy, you would have thought, well, at least we're across the river. Your 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 spirits would have been at least lifted for a while. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, we know they're going to run headlong into the poles, uh, and and the poles are not going to let any German they can if they they've got an ounce of strength left, they're going to kill every German they can. So yeah. there's very much a a massive great um, battle coming ahead of them. But if you're going up this road now, Duncan, we've got Duncan's feet. This is the road leading up from Wasi Ford. And I showed it early on. There's a, I think I showed it. There's a very famous photo taken just up this lane. We'll see if we can get to the point where these buildings in that photo come into view. If we can keep Duncan's connection. Go. And this is this is taken again at the end of the battle here with the dead horses. And we know that censorship was a big issue in World War II, David. So I always wonder if these are the photos that got let through the censor, what ones didn't yeah. get let through? You know, uh, these yeah. ones are horrific enough. Yeah. Um, but you know, you wonder what would have been seen there. And you know, I, I I always talk about Eisenhower talking about walking through the gap at the end of the battle. You know, so, referring to it as a site only Dante could describe being possible to walk for hundreds of yards at a time, stepping on nothing but dead and decaying flesh. And this is Eisenhower saying that, who doesn't yeah. really speak in those terms, does he? Eisenhower no. is very, he's very pragmatic. He's very reserved. Um, reserved. Yeah. Fanny's Gap and Dachau are the two occasions I think he kind of lets his guard down and shows a bit more of a softer, cuddlier side. Because um, he has to, I mean, he's a supreme commander. He's got to be detached to some extent. But he does. And there's, I mean, we lose Duncan's quality is, is bad with the connection. But those buildings there are the buildings you saw in that photo there. Yeah. And yeah, and it will bring us neatly into our next our next show that will be coming up in an hour's time with Jenny yeah. talking about the polls. Um, the the action we, we 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 said we were going to debate whether or not David Curry's VC was re. I mean, is it really a VC action or not? I mean, some people would say yes, it definitely is. Some would say it definitely isn't. David, there is this suggestion that the Battle of the Normandy is ending. The Canadians hadn't awarded one yet. We better get one in before the the the, the, the chapter changes, and maybe that's part of the reason why he awarded it was awarded it. I mean, that's that's what what's your feeling on that? Well, first of all, I mean, anybody who's ever awarded the Victoria Cross, I would never say you did not deserve it. No. Um, but the thing is, is you're right. I mean, what you're alluding to is, is there is a quota system for awards and medals. There's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, at the beginning of the war, you tend to see quite a lot of them uh, handed out. And then there's a real dearth for the longest time in awarding the Victoria Cross. But then when, like in the end of World War I, the last hundred days, when suddenly it looks like victory is on the horizon, they tend to drop the bar a little bit, if you will, um, and start handing them out. Not like candy, <laughs> by any means. No. Uh, you know, they're not North Korean generals. Um, you know, awards for North Korean generals or Russian generals in some cases. Um, but they are, you know, the bar has dropped a tad. And perhaps, you know, the most cynical way of interpreting this is to say that the bar had been dropped and Curry has given this, not necessarily for his own actions on that day, per se, but because of what it symbolizes. Yeah. Definitely. It symbolizes the Canadian effort. It symbolizes the closing of the gap, the defeat of the German army in Normandy, et cetera. So I, mean, Alex, I think Alex Fitzgerald thing. Black has commented and said he, he thinks the original uh, recommendation was for DSO, which would make sense. 
perfect. And, uh, and it possibly got upgraded because, hang on, we better give a, a, a Victoria Cross. And I mean, my, my, the question I always have, and I completely admit this is me looking at it, having been down and spent days and days at Fade's Gap over years and years, is why the hell Curry didn't blow up that bridge when he first saw it. That, that, I, that does kind of, I know you could say, well, he hasn't got any dem demolitions gear, you know, put a Sherman tank on it, back another one up and hit it, hit it and block it deny it but that's me being very picky and yeah. i don't really like getting into that kind of game but you know it is no but it may just be it may not even head. yeah it may not even be a defensive mindset he's in you know that's the whole thing i mean the idea is yes you're going to block it and you're going to hold on to it but at the same time you're holding on to it because you're going to use it and you know the idea is you're in a pursuit battle so the idea is that you know you want to be able to use the kind of terrain that you're uh, to defend well, in fairness, play. we're not going that way, though, are we? We're not, to be fair, we're not going yeah. west now. But, no. I mean, that's, that's the, the, the interesting thing is, though, I mean, when you read about Wotherspoon's uh, evaluation of, of Curry, he says he was very defend, dependable, very stubborn, but he did say he wasn't the greatest tactician. And, yeah. and, and I think Curry does what he's told to do, which is take an advanced reconnaissance in the village, and he, he doesn't get to the point where he thinks about blowing up bridges it wasn't part of his remit i suppose so you know it's it yeah is he's it. not the kind of character who was known to take initiative in that sense in other words as as you said witherspoon says you know he wasn't tactically brilliant but god he was stubborn yeah. so yeah. you know there are merits to that in certain circumstances but if you're talking about a commander on the ground exercising fingertip feel and thinking about the larger picture and then taking action based on that, maybe Curry's not that kind of guy. He's not from that mindset. Yeah, so you're going to get well what be. you're going to get from Curry, and that's exactly what you got. So, I mean, we're kind of we're we're an hour and five minutes in now. We've got to give the camera teams their break for their next show, and we we didn't get quite the images of the Ford I wanted in the end, but we got more than I kind of thought we would at the worst case scenario. So we got some images there, and of course, you know, we could discuss. Curry and San Lambert, so Dave and the, the, the battles around for another hour or two. The point of this is always to be a taster of these events, get across some of the ground, get some conversations going and kind of move on to other things. We can have David back on and talk about, you know, this a, 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 a panel discussion. But the, the point is we've got to let the camera teams charge their batteries up for our next show now. So uh, thank you very much, Mag and Duncan and Joe for doing the best you can to keep images going. We've got, Duncan seems to have got an image back in the uh, the village there itself, but we'll let those guys drop out ready for the next show in 55 minutes. And um, so thanks very much, guys. We'll join you. Go and get your batteries charged up and we'll see you later. I'll drop you out of the meeting. And I'll just carry on talking to Dave for a bit. So thanks, guys. Brilliant work. Um, right. So it's just us two now. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that was that was pretty good. Yeah, I, yeah. We'll we could we'll just sum things up a little bit there. So the carry action was incredibly important, and oh, actually, Mag has got an image of the Ford there. So before we, can I just? It's not quite big and good enough to actually share. I, I can't. This is one of the things about how the, the the vagaries of Zoom. I can see it when I have the four screens where I try and spotlight her page. It doesn't. The signal disappears. So. So, Mag, I'm going to drop you out because we just can't get your image. OK, so um, we'll speak to you later. So there we are. So um, it's an important action. They delayed things. They forced the Germans to, to, to choose alternative areas. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have if you want to come back on, David, at the end of this third show and, and join us for a summary, then you'll be welcome to. But, sure. you know, the fact is that the, the, it was an incredible victory, the Allies. Uh, took at the, the Falaise Gap. Sure, some Germans got out. Sure, there's more we could have encircled there. Yeah. But given how fast the situation changed, given, and we didn't touch on it earlier, the potential of friendly fire. That's the other issue of yeah. the, the, the Americans coming out from the south and the and Canadians coming down. <laughs> With artillery that can fire the ranges we're talking about, we could have started inflicting casualties on each other uh, which were all, already dealing with blue on blue from the air. I mean, Curry's yeah. force was hit by Spitfires at least twice. So, you know, the last thing we want is to start having artillery fire coming in as well. And so, you know. Well, you, yeah, but you do. I mean, one of the things is the, you know, as we alluded to before, we were talking about the idea of dancing to who's tune. Yeah. And the Western allies are not really interested in taking on the kind of maneuver battle that the Germans are in at the moment because they realize that the Germans can outstep them very quickly. They're, they're adept at doing this. So you're not going to play the game that your opponent is calling. So... 
there was a lot of discussion over whether you should just use firepower over manpower to close the gap. So in other words, just allow the Germans to stampede through a funnel, but make sure that that funnel is um, you know, completely covered by your artillery, your air power, et cetera, and expose yeah. them to firepower, which is essentially what they end up doing around the base. Yeah. Um, so they were always worried. And it, I go back to, and I think it was Bradley or maybe it was, uh, maybe it was, uh, Eisenhower who said, you know, when, when they turned the corner around, uh, uh, was it Avranche or Argentan, they said, look, it's, you know, it, it, it's better to be able to pull back than to stick your neck out and have it broken. And, yeah. you know, when you have a massive soldiery like the Germans are, who are now picking up steam and starting to stampede as you're going to see in the next show, when it comes to the poles on the mace. You're looking at a tsunami coming your way. Yeah, and I just want to kind of get across this idea as well that a lot of the books that talk about the Falaise Gap, that they're the various authors, be they British, American, Canadian, Polish, French, whoever, they're concluding their Normandy book. They're deciding, they've now decided who they're going to make their villains and their heroes. They've built their case and they're coming to conclusion time. So you get people like Richard Romer's book, Patton's Gap, a Canadian air marshal yep. retired, who spends the entire 400 pages saying that Montgomery was a prat for the entire book, basically, and should have done more. Other people say that Patton should have done more, Bradley should have done more. And as Jonathan Ware reassessed history on Twitter, reminded me before before I was going to do this show, is that the various uh, figures, Bradley and Montgomery, they changed their version of these stories as the years pass as well. So what they oh, said yeah. at meetings then were not what they said in their biographies later on. So you end up in this pissing contest yeah. where each historian puts their case forward of who they think is to blame or not to blame or the hero here, and it ends up being like opinions and like our souls, oh, everybody yeah. has one. So what I want to do with this show is what we've accomplished with the show. We talk about the ground, talk about the terrain, talk about this this maelstrom of action that happens around Curry. Sure, maybe he could have done things a bit differently, but given the force he had, and let's run through the, the, the statistics. He, he he goes down. To, he had he had the fifty five men he started with in the Argyles and a kind of a, a company reinforced, but it wasn't the full strength company. And he walks no. away with about 30% of his original force, doesn't he? Something like that. And I think three of his 15 Sherman tanks are left running at the end of this engagement. So yeah. it's not that we can say he didn't commit fully to this. You know, he, he, oh, he no, not at all. the force yeah. drastically reduced. Um, he no, and, it, it, it's, and it's also kind of like it. saying when we were talking about the end, about him, you know, requesting relief or requesting to pull out. He had done his job. Yeah. You know, beyond. Yeah what was necessary. And so any request is really one of, of mercy at this point, you know, to get them out. Um, so nobody can fault him for, you know, for attempting to pull the plug on that one. And I think there's comments going, we'll stop the, the show in a minute, there's comments going on YouTube about the generals and Carrera and Simmons, <laughs> all these guys and Pat and everybody else. And the thing is, there's lots of books about that. There really needs to be some more books that discuss the battle at the sharp end. And, and and not just the units involved in San Lambert. There's the units like the, Brif yeah. the British 53rd Welsh Division, the 59th Staffordshire Division. They're involved. You've got the American 1st, the 90th. 9th. They're all pushing yeah. from behind. Uh, no one talks about that very much. We all French. focus on San Lambert and the Poles. And there's no. a much wider story that can be talked about of what these units are facing. But it tends to be always these generals' opinions about who did what. And, and I, yeah. I find that... It's not that I find it boring. It's just that I care more about the men on the ground. So anyway, thanks, David. It's been extraordinary stuff. I'm going to have a break now. And My we'll, pleasure as usual. Go, for you as watching, join us again in just over 45 minutes for the last part with the amazing Jenny Grant, who will come and tell us some, all about the polls and match and Mason. And that'll be fantastic. And we'll have David and Sean on at the end of it to just do a little conclusion again. So thanks very much, David. I'll speak to you later, my friend. It was a brilliant show and I'll end this stream. So thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to join us again in 45 minutes. Good job, Woody and gang. See you soon. Right. Good. So that was the stream is ending.